So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to the SYP Oxford's webinar, Literary Festivals, The New Normal. So I'm Fliss and I'm an events officer for the SYP Oxford and I'm going to be chairing our event this evening. We're aiming for the webinar to last around an hour. Firstly, we're going to talk about the new normal, organising literary events and festivals during a pandemic. And then we'll go into some more general discussion about the world of programming and events. And our lovely panellists will be giving us their tips and tricks for getting into the industry and sharing their own experiences. We're going to have a Q&A as well, so you can ask any questions that you might have. Please feel free to ask questions at any point during the webinar. So if something occurs to you, you can use the little Q&A function, which is down at the bottom of your screen. So in case you aren't familiar with us, the Society of Young Publishers, we represent anyone in the first 10 years of working in the publishing industry, as well as other related industries. We also represent you publishing hopefuls out there as well. So we have committees in Oxford, London, the North, Southwest, Scotland and Ireland. We all organise panels and social events to help members learn more about the industry and connect with other people in similar positions. The SYP also organises mentoring schemes. In fact, Oxford's mentoring scheme was launched today and that's now spreading across the UK and Ireland. So if you're interested, get involved with that. We also have a quarterly magazine called Imprint, which is sent out to our members. Here in Oxford, we also have a monthly book club and a fortnightly podcast. So that's a little bit about who we are. So what are we going to be talking about this evening? So the last few months have undeniably been a difficult time for programmers, events and literary festival teams. People working in this sector, the events officers from the SYP included, have had to adapt to a new and often virtual normal as a result of our ongoing need to socially distance this year. So this webinar, our aim is to have our panellists give us an insight into their work this year and their take on the future of literary festivals. So let's introduce our lovely panel. So we have Ni Ayikwe Parks from Brighton Dome and Festival. We have Harriet Reed Ryan from Henley Literary Festival. And we have Lindsay Finneran from Cheltenham Literature Festival. Sadly, Sally Dunsmore from the Oxford Literary Festival can't join us today as she's unwell, but she sends her apologies. So I'm going to hand over to you guys to introduce yourselves um, in a little more depth. Should we start off with you, Ni? Uh, yeah, why not? So I'm Ni Aikwe Parks and I am the producer of Literature and Talks at Brighton Dome and Brighton Festival. Um, Brighton, in Brighton, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a fish in a pond because it's a multi-genre festival. Um, so you have theater, you have dance, you have music, comedy. Um, and so you're not just programming a festival, you're also competing for um, seats. Um, so it's quite interesting. And I joined them just, um, this is my second year, um, after programming pretty much freelance for most of my life. I started programming in Manchester, when I was a student in 1997 with an organization called Common Word. Um, but it's always just been a, a hobby of mine. And um, I, I love um, facilitating conversations, which I think is really what this job is about for me. Um, I think that will do us an introduction. Yeah, great, thank you. Lindsay? Hi everyone, um, I'm Lindsay Finner and I'm the program and commissions manager for the Cheltenham Literature Festival. Um, so I work very closely with our head of programming and a team of programmers to curate the annual Cheltenham Literature Festival, which in a normal year is uh, runs for 10 days um, in early October. We have about 500 events running over those 10 days, um, everything from an 80 seater right up to a 1500 seater, uh, with close to a thousand writers and speakers coming in from all over the world. So we put that program together. Um, in the commissioning element of my role, I commission some new work. I also lead on things like international programming and international um, relationships, probably with other festivals, other producers. Um, found there's something called the Lit Crawl, which I'm sure we'll get into when we talk about different formats. And yes, we've just launched our program for this year's festival, which is going to be a hybrid version, but I'm sure we'll get into that as well. Great. And last but not least, Harriet. Um, I am the events uh, director for um, programmer for Henley Literary Festival, which is in its 14th year. 
um, and I organise all of, I programme the whole festival, um, not the children's side now, we've got a brilliant children's programme, so just the adult side, um, and we usually have uh, about 190 events over nine days, which is sort of equates to about 400 speakers um, coming from everywhere but this year it is looking very different uh, like they all are we are have gone virtual we went on sale about a month ago um with a reduced kind of 40 event um festival um which so things have changed quite dramatically but um i've been working with the festival since it began so have been in lots of different roles covered most of the areas and i'm very happy doing programming but fell into it by by accident rather than by uh, commitment <laughs> But I'm now very committed. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you so much. So first off, I think it would be great to establish how the pandemic has actually affected your work and your literary festival. So kind of going into how your process has changed and, and the new normal, as it were. Do you want to start off, Harriet? Yeah, I mean, I think it was really interesting because, and I'm sure Lindsay would say the same what we were kind of 80 percent programmed when it happened so it's changed it quite dramatically because it's not only that we've had to we've kind of had to do a lot of undoing as well as working in a new version to try and go into an area that we haven't ever really known we've done a couple of kind of we had a virtual event years ago where somebody couldn't come from america so they joined with the interview on stage there um and that is sort of as far as our virtual world has gone and now we've had to go to the full virtual um which has just been a lot more work and i'm sure like lots of other people there's been redundancy so the team has got a lot smaller so the workload has been more juggly than ever before and um but more exciting in lots of ways as well. Like, you know, it's a really exciting new challenge. Um, and even just doing this, you know, it's exciting that we're all talking tonight and people are all probably sitting in their pajamas and, you know, it's so much easier. So I think there's lots of, there are lots of positives come from it, but yeah, basically we've had to redo the whole program and just come down to these 40 uh, kind of headline events rather than go for our original 190. 190, yeah. So it's quite a big reduction in a way. Yeah. yeah, huge. And also trying to keep the scope of the festival within that, as well as trying to juggle actually who's going to come for online events, you know, what, what online audience we're going to get. And it's a different sort of way to market it. And so we've done things like we have done a printed programme, which I think um, Lindsay was just saying they haven't done one. Um, but that was a decision that actually to almost get some of our old school uh, buyers into the digital world, I kind of almost felt like we needed to get in through their letterbox. So we have done that. Mm -hmm. so, so we've kept some of the old things and then moved on with other things has it been particularly different with with Cheltenham so one thing to say to start with Cheltenham is that we're Cheltenham festival so we run four festivals under one banner so we have jazz in May science in June classical music in July and then literature in October and literature is the biggest of the four um, so when it was all sort of creeping in in March, it was quite a quick decision to cancel the physical jazz and science festivals. And they did a fully um, digital version. Um, classical music we had to cancel, that was in July. Um, and then I think the feeling with literature, because it's further on in the year, it was, do you go fully digital? Do you try and do a hybrid? You know, has digital fatigue set in by autumn when everyone's been looking at Zoom for, for months and months? So we felt we wanted to try if we could in a really safe way to get back to some physical events. Um, so the model we've landed on is um, a bit like Harriet, honing down the program. So we usually do 500. We've got, ended up at about 160 in the total program. Um, rather than building a full festival site, which obviously isn't very COVID friendly and it's very expensive, we've got three fixed venues in Cheltenham um, that a lot of authors are still traveling to do the events live from. And then we're streaming that out digitally. And we thought that option, if COVID and the whole situation gets better, that means we can open up to some limited social distance physical ticket sales and get some of that you know, physical event feeling back. If it doesn't, we can just treat them as closed, almost like a TV studio um, and treat it that way. Things have gone fairly well. I mean, I'm touching wood and I'm crossing everything. Um, we did get the green light from the government two weeks ago to open up some physically distance uh, ticket sales in a very safe way. Um, so if everything goes fine in the next few weeks, what we should pull off is a, a, a live festival, which has some live audiences, but equally everything that happens on a stage is beamed out live and free to a digital audience as well. And then 
uh, again, what Harry was saying, you don't want to lose the scope of the festival, you don't want to lose the diversity of the festival. And I don't want to lose the international aspect as well, because that's something I've been really been building with the festival. And the theme actually for this year was meant to be Read the World, and it's meant to have the biggest year yet for panelists flying in and everything, which obviously wasn't going to happen. But what we have put in is 20 purely digital sessions with international writers where we've gone into their studios or their, their homes to speak to them there. So we've, yeah, we've ended up a bit of a hybrid and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, in a way the um, kind of internet allows for things to be a little bit more international in a way that live events don't. So. It does. And I think I think that was coming down the track for us anyway, as event organisers in, in terms of climate, you know, the kind of responsibility of flying authors halfway around the world to do a couple of big events. I think that was going to be squeezed anyway. And I think this has pushed us on to, you know, find the technologies, find the ways of having these conversations. And, you know, I have to say, we've been filming some of these international conversations in the last couple of weeks and they've been the highlight for me. Um, you know, you get to be in Marilyn Robinson's living room or Sayak Marata's studio and some of the conversations you get are actually better. They feel very intimate. And I think one of the, one of the benefits is that I think author conversations compared to something like theatre or live gigs, they can translate fairly well to an online format. So that is a that is a positive for us, I think. Yeah, definitely. How about with Brighton, Nee? What's the situation? Oh, I mean, as you can imagine, we're set almost um, six months away from Cheltenham and Henley, I guess. We're like May. So I had a fully programmed festival. Brochure was printed. Um, and then we had to cancel. So it was very much managing relationships with writers. Um, obviously, my fellow producers were doing it for other art forms as well. Um, and just being up front, I mean, initially it was very difficult because the government wasn't clear. So I, I think, you know, if there was anything that was really a problem, it's the fact that the government has never been quite clear enough about where we are, what the policy is. So it's very difficult when you're an event producer and you depend on the environment, when, whether people can travel, how they can travel, what numbers you can have in a venue, what's the social distance, what's the... Um, government guidelines on sanitizing, on keeping your audiences safe, you know, it was all up in the air. So in the end, we we had to cancel. Um, and as somebody who's an author myself, it was very heartbreaking, but, you know, I was very upfront and, and honest with the authors. And, and I think we, we went past that pretty much okay. I think we had two virtual events, um, primarily with Lem Sise, who is the guest director, um, who did an event with his book, My Name is Why, and, um, and I think we had one more, but that was it. Um, because we, we couldn't plan anything in that time, um, it, you know, so we just, we just had to focus on huddling, people went on fellow, et cetera, and then thinking about next year. And I think next year, um, we're obviously thinking about, again, as, you know, Lindsay and Harriet have said, um, a more hybrid approach, but also looking at the, the positive, the, the opportunities that come with it. I mean, for me, you know, when we say new normal, the, the notion of normal in the context of literature in the UK already for me means exclusions um, for marginalized communities, for working class writers. Um, and even in terms of in, invites to festivals, people who live outside of the South get invited less because festivals have budgets and they'll start thinking about whose train am I paying for? I mean, these are the realities of it. So um, normal means exclusions anyway. So maybe the positive that comes out of this is when you're looking at a hybrid program, then you can begin to include, you know, people who might have been excluded um, for reasons which might not have been literary at all. Um, and also to think about... Um, unusual conversations that you can have, you know, um, just because of the fact that people might be talking virtually if that's um, part of the festival. So I think for me, it's, it's really been about rethinking what our normal is and what might be the things that might improve that normal. And then given the circumstances and, and the digital capabilities we have at the moment, how can we find somewhere in between to create a great experience for, you know, our, our visitors, uh, you know, um, yeah, our audiences of all kinds, whether it's digital, whether it's in person, 
Um, and I think the tricky thing, as with all things, I mean, I just mentioned budgets, is to think of how do you monetize when you're doing something virtual. And I think that's one of the things that um, we're grappling with. We're, we're looking at the best ways to do it so that the audience experience is satisfaction rather than a kind of feeling of being shortchanged or being taken advantage of. We don't want our audiences to feel like we're only putting this on so that we can take money in and sustain the festival because actually what we are creating is experiences for them and to, to kind of start conversations. So if they can't be in the room, how do we make sure the conversations continue? You know, these are the things that um, we're thinking about. So, I mean, unlike Harriet and Lindsay who, who are having a festival in a couple of weeks. Um, Don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't actually, you know, we, we haven't programmed yet. We're having those conversations and um, it's a blessing and a curse to have that time because the time also means that the government might mess up even more. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's better to get it done with, um, but we'll see. And, and I think part of that is also dialogue with, with other festivals um, to, to think about, you know, the, the quality of experience that we can give to literature lovers around the world because now the moment you go virtual you're 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 delivering to everybody yeah definitely what does that mean for translation etc you know mm -hmm. yeah completely and i think that it's interesting to think about what we're going to keep and what we're going to kind of throw away from this experience and we just had a question in asking about how you're trying to capture the live performance kind of aspect so maybe that's something interesting to talk about in terms of what we're keeping and, and what we're kind of getting rid of what have you been looking at kind of try in this respect, Lindsay? Well, I think that was one of my thoughts, actually. The, um, the positives that an, is a, an author conversation can translate quite well to Zoom. I think what doesn't quite translate are those really, those events that bring in lots of different elements. And for me, that's often the most exciting literary events, you know, where you're bringing in music or dance or food or you're doing site-specific work and it gets a bit more theatrical. I think that's where some really exciting literary programming is happening. That isn't something we've really been able to do this year and I'd be interesting to see what we can what what can be done with that area on a digital service I think we've you, you know if you've got a few months to t turn a massive festival around turn it online um you know whilst you're dealing with the fallout of coronavirus you you can push certain things but you also have to go back to what you know for other things and I think it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of settles in and how it all settles down on that front yeah, definitely. And in terms of knee for Brighton, you've also got dance and, and theatre. And yeah. that kind of atmosphere is very strong. Is that something that you're having conversations about at the minute? Yeah, I mean, we appreciate, especially for those art forms, um, we even have circus, you know. So mm -hmm. you think about those art forms, which are very much about physicality and energy. And it is tricky if you're going to translate that to a digital format. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. I mean, we're producers because we're supposed to imagine new ways of seeing the world, right? So um, that's what we do. And, and there is conversation between art forms and, and there are ways in which you can, you know, some of it might involve the audience um, doing certain things. Like you say to somebody wear a noise cancelling headphone, you, you know, um, that kind of thing just to kind of immerse them in, there's so many things that can come into play. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you just have to look at the options and see what's best. But I think similar to, to Lindsay, especially for some of the, the art forms, they will try to kind of do something in the room so that, because I, mean, I think artist energy derives a little bit from the audience. So if you have some kind of audience in the room, as much as you know, it's a virtual event, you, you, you can translate some of that energy. Um, you, you, I mean, there are things, interesting things happening online, like the Versus um, um, events that are happening for music online. And, and you see lots of excitement on, you, you see like hundreds of thousands of people following on Instagram, um, two musicians just sharing their music and, and having a bit of banter, you know. Um, so that energy can, translate but you do need that the reason why that energy translates is because you have two musicians kind of you know um passing it back and forth between themselves 
having history, context, all of these things are beautiful things. And as I, I, I keep coming back to, it's about conversations. And, and, and the conversation is, you know, what is the audience's reaction and how can I feed that back into the person who's projecting the art or whatever it is. So, you know, that's the part that maybe when we think of digital programming, especially for literature, yes, we might think of the element of somebody reading the book out, but then how do we transfer the energy back to them of somebody going, hmm, in the audience when, you know, the line has, you know, totally eviscerated their heart and they, they, they don't know what to do with themselves. How, you know, how do we do that? So it's important for us to think about these things in, in, in both ways. And I, I, you know, I just think that it's a huge challenge, but there are opportunities within this. And if we can figure it out, then it should alter the way that we run festivals going forward. Because there are people in places who have wanted to see certain authors for ages, and this might be their chance, but there are also people for whom um, there is no access to internet. So this is still going to be a rumor, but if we can record these things, does this mean that in some way they get to access it later? You know, there's so many things that come out of this because the moment you're doing a Zoom, it means you can record it. Whereas when it's live in a room, sometimes the festival is choosing which ones to film because you can't have that many film crews. You know, a festival is not a film set. <laughs> so, there are all of these things which I think, you know, there are opportunities within it. Huge challenges, no doubt. And, and I don't envy Lindsay and Harriet having to go first in relation to me. <laughs> but um, but I, 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 do, I do think there are opportunities there. It's, it's tricky, but, you know, let's not feel like the appetite for culture is always going to be there. The way we consume it has changed. I mean, when there weren't microphones, it didn't mean that there, weren't, there wasn't culture. When there weren't stages, it doesn't mean there wasn't culture. So what do we do with what we have now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's scope to be more inclusive, but also something is definitely being lost at the same time. Do you have anything to add, Harry, about things that you think might stick, might be in the, in the Henley um, Festival next year? Um, I mean, what we, we had an event that was supposed to be in March. We need some pop-ups and we've moved it virtual. And um, the second we sent out the emails, we had a call instantly from a single mother who said, oh, I couldn't go because I couldn't get any childcare and now I can come and me and my book club are all going to watch it. And that, you know, that instantly made me think, oh, good. <laughs> like there was a, you know, like actually we're being more inclusive without even realising, you know, that actually I thought we were going to have lots of, and we did have lots of disappointed emails and people asking for refunds and all of that. But we also had this sort of idea that, oh, I can now come and I couldn't come, which I hadn't, I guess until that moment, because it's been so busy, I hadn't kind of thought of those Positives. And I mean, our main aim, I think, was to make sure our audience were happy because we are having to charge full sustainability like that. We just don't have another option. Um, so it was making sure that our audiences are happy. And then you've got to think about the, how much further we can go with it as well. So it's kind of got to be a double um, thing of like, you know, if our audience are happy, then it also allows us to do other things. Um, I mean, I think the international asks are for us much better this year like we can definitely ask people and and also I think what Lindsay said I think I have there are things I have struggled to enjoy virtually but I do think there's something about a book event I do that you know we have loads of people who come on their own so this is kind of the same you know it's we're not changing the conversation in that sense so it is still two people and when we have done our pop-up ones the conversations and the chats going on in the chat do give more of that audience feedback than I thought they would initially I was kind of very aware that it was going to feel like a dead sort of silence but it doesn't because people are saying things and they're saying oh isn't that fun and even if perhaps the speakers can't see it quite as quickly as as an audience member you really feel like you are kind of all sitting and it's something oddly special about that side so mm -hmm. i do think the kind of international side will definitely stick and i think it sort of made maybe made us realize that we could record more there are some moments in literary festivals that i wish i had recorded or been out of scene because i'd want to watch them again and again and again and actually you do realize now how much easier that side's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, we've actually had a question just come in about your existing audiences and whether you're feeling as though you can cater for those existing audiences, maintaining those relationships rather than competing for a kind of global audience that now everyone can have access to via the internet. How do you think this has affected um, Cheltenham, Lindsay? 
We'll see. We go on sale this week. Um, but I think, I, I mean, we're a very old festival. We've been running 70 years now. So we've got a very committed core audience um, who actually have responded incredibly well in all our comms. Um, they know it's been a tough time. They're kind of coming on that journey with us. I mean, I think if we'd been running in March, um, it'd be a lot harder. But I think they've, I've heard them, the baby zoomers being, sorry, baby boomers being called baby zoomers now, you know, COVID force a lot of people to kind of get to grips with new technologies and you know when you think about that maybe older more core daytime audience at a literary festival you know they're a lot more tech, tech savvy than we might think they are so I'm hoping they'll come along in that in that sense um and it was interesting, interesting I was chatting to the the San Francisco lit director um lit fest director and he was saying you know we're obviously competing for this space but his experience of the events they've done so far it's quite a local audience that are tuning in because they feel that loyalty um, and there's still a sense of place and I'm hoping because Cheltenham sort of filmed on Cheltenham stages it's still going to sort of feel a little bit like Cheltenham there's still be that familiarity there as well which might help but I mean it's all it's all a big experiment I think but I think the core audience people who've been with us for many many years are just happy that it's happening in some form and are, are very understanding you know we've been given a, a dealt a hell of a hand this year to 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 survive within um, so I'm hoping they'll sort of come along with us but as both Nee and Harry have said I'm really hoping this got blows the doors off a little bit as well and opens up to more, you know, a more diverse audience, um, people who can't access it for whether it's geographical reasons, financial reasons, or just don't think it's for them. You know, I didn't, I wasn't into book events before I started to work in them. I didn't think they were for me. Um, so I think if we can reach a few people like that and convert a few people, that's amazing. So that, that's a positive. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any thoughts on that, Nee? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that audiences are quite, are loyal to festivals, not just because they're local, you know, it's because every festival has a twist, right? The kinds of conversations they facilitate, etc. So people buy into that. You don't tend to lose them. I mean, even though we canceled, lots of the audiences that had bought tickets were quite happy to, to, to donate, you know, their ticket fees. Some of them, obviously, we, we offered refunds and they just kind of would take a token we didn't basically we didn't have to give all the money back and that tells you um the loyalty because for a council festival there's no guarantee of anything else happening you know it's it's completely different if you're saying we're doing a digital version and somebody decides okay well i mean i paid for a live experience but i'll just experience it digitally and i'm not going to complain but it tells you about the loyalty of audiences i mean i think brighton has an incredibly um loyal and savvy local audience for literature you know um and they will come and tell you <laughs> at the end of the programs if the literature has been good this year or not um and what they've liked about it and that kind of thing um and, and and i think it's really interesting because you can see the same author in three different festivals and you'll get a totally different experience and i think that's something to remember um and so i think when we are accessing global audiences we're not accessing global audiences because you know, suddenly um, San Francisco Literature Festival is not going to get people. It's because there are people who like, you know, the tone of the conversation that we're promising and they want to access it. And they may not have been able to do that before, but they're going to do it. So it can only be positive. And I think if we think of those global audiences as additions rather than, um, you know, a new audience that is going to replace what we have, I mean, you're going to have losses at, at some point because of various reasons. I mean, I have an uncle who goes to lots of literature festivals. He doesn't own a computer. He's not interested, right? Um, so for him, this is just blank. Unless I go and play something for him on my, on my phone, he's not interested, right? But it doesn't mean he doesn't love literature. He'll come back to it on his own terms. And there are people like that. So you lose some of those. But then you'll also gain um, people who just... I mean, you, you might have people who just want to hear a British accent, <laughs> you know? I mean, you, you, you don't know why people go to events. So what you do is you create the conversation and hopefully people come and partake in it. And, and, and the joy, and I, I'm sure Lindsay and Harry will agree, the joy really of our job is, you know, yeah, you talk to people, you convince them to come, you write the copy, you put it out, people buy tickets. But the real joy is watching it happen seeing the audience reaction, seeing the look on their faces, 
seeing the moderator and the author have a great time or two authors have a moment where they're giggling uncontrollably. You can't, you know, it's not something you can predict, but what an experience it is for a reader to be there and to see that and to, to have this great art form humanized, right? And, but we don't have to be face to face to humanize, you know, we can humanize this way and, and that's what we're trying to do. So ultimately, um, look, if there weren't budgets, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We'd just be celebrating the fact that, you know, we can have these conversations with the writers. It's because of budgets, yeah. partly, that we have to think about these things because if we can't bring audiences through the door, then it means, you know, something's being lost. We can't pay authors who are at the center of our work in the same way that we can pay them if we can't make the money. So something's got to give, right? Um, but if we didn't have that, we, we'd just be we just be putting these fantastic conversations together and giggling to ourselves. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. I think it was really interesting, something you said about how if we went to every single one of the different literary festivals and we saw the same author, that it would be different. And what do you think does make your festival different? How would that conversation be different if it were at Henley, for example, or Cheltenham? What's your USP? Our USP. Um, I, we have very small venues and seem to still get the quite big names. So I think there are very kind of intimate conversations that happen. I think that's completely what it is. I think, you know, what you were saying, Nia, about those moments and those, I, I kind of feel so sad that they're not going to happen this year, but I know they are going to happen in some way. But, you know, when we had Dorian Lawrence stand on stage and read, you know, in a church and we'd managed to give free tickets to the local school kids and she was reading Until I Rise. But I mean, like, you can't, you can't reenact that and you definitely can't reenact that on Zoom. But those are moments that go down that bring us, you know, brilliant conversations. So I think our, ours is small venues and still the big names. Um, I think our book sales are very good. We're, I mean, we're in a very affluent area. We know that. So I think our lot know that they have to buy books. So we've always been very lucky that our book sales sort of compete with the numbers, you know, the 1500 seaters, even in the 300 seaters. So that's something that the publishers have trusted with us. Um, and that's why our program this year has quite a lot of book and ticket because that was sort of the only way to make sure that authors are still getting book sales and also, you know, that we're still trying to move all of that along. Um, so I think that's our USB. I, it's, it turns into like a lovely, brilliant town of people talking. And I think Henley's so known for kind of rowing and what someone said, like gin and jags, you know, and actually it can become cultural and interesting. And we have conversations that you would never usually have in Henley. And we can facilitate that and that what an opportunity that is. So I guess that's our USP. Absolutely. Great. What about you, Lindsay? Uh, I guess, well, I guess officially it's, we're the oldest one in the world. So we're the, the first one. Um, so that'd be the sort of the, the official tagline. Um, I think for me, it's, it's making sure they've got the best of the best. So we've got the, the biggest kind of names coming through the doors, the Booker winners, the Pulitzer winners, etc. cetera. Um, but it's about unique pairings as well. And I think, <laughs> what I never want Chelton to be is just another st stop on the book tour and that you could see that same conversation if you went to four of the different festivals, four of the different bookshops. So I'm always trying, myself and the team are always really careful, you know, with the choice of chair or can you add in an extra element that just brings something else out in that conversation and makes it a bit special. So that, that's a real priority. And I think what I've been trying to do with my time in Chelton as well is just sort of shake up what, shake up what Chelton might be perceived as, shake up, shake up what a book festival might be perceived as and just try and sort of, come out of the tents a little bit more and you know get away from that model of you buy your ticket and you come sit down and you watch your thing for one hour and then you get up and you go to the next thing with the ticket you know so it's making sure that you've got those yes you've got those conversations and those panels and those lectures that you buy a ticketed buy a ticket for sorry um but also you've got some amazing free stuff going on or you've got some little unexpected surprises because you want to come away from that day having a really rich rounded experience and often it's those I mean, I'm sure you both, you all feel this as well when you're at your festivals. It's those events that kind of creep up on you. The thing that, you know, you wasn't at the top of your wish list or wasn't at the, you know, your most eagerly awaited event, but actually something comes in and you hear something and it stays with you. And it's, it's, it's that discovery element, I think. I think allowing for that and making that a bit kind of more flexible, a bit more, a bit fresher as well. That's a big priority for me. Yeah. Yeah. What about Brighton? I mean, Brighton also has lots of different art forms as well as, a, as an obvious one. Yeah, I mean, it's the largest multi-arts festival in the UK. So you're going to come and you're going to meet, you know, artists from different kind of um, disciplines. 
um, that's as the writer's experience, but also the audience experience is that they'll come there and often they'll see something in the brochure that they hadn't planned to go to that they'll go to. But in terms of the conversations, um, I think every producer comes in slightly differently. So I'm only two years in and my focus really has been about juxtaposition. You know, I, I'm, I, I really believe in um, championing people who don't have as big a PR machine, um, who, who, might, who are great writers, um, and also just having conversations where authors are just talking about the world, because I think you can buy the book, you know? Um, so, you know, I had a conversation with um, Shalina Permalu, um, who's a cookbook author, and we're talking about um, how flavors travel around the world and stuff like that. So, you know, it's an intellectual conversation um, where it's not about the pictures in the cookbook, you know, and, 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 but about the traveling of ideas, even though food is the medium we're talking about, you know. Um, and then we also have conversations just between authors, you know, on themes and stuff like that, bringing in younger authors, talk to older authors, um, having people come and pay tribute. We did... Um, we did an event um, honoring Maya Angelou, just brought in some fantastic young poets. Nobody, I mean, people didn't really know them, but they left, that, that event was sold out and everybody left saying we need to bring them back a second night. Um, again, it, it teaches the audience something. It says to them, I don't have to have seen this name in the Guardian or the Independent or the Times for it to move me, right? We, we did the tribute because it was, um, the anniversary of um, Maya Angelou's passing. So we sold her books. She wasn't there, but the, it was a tribute event and they'd written in response to her themes extra. And, you know, so that's the kind of thing I look for the opportunity to explore ideas. The book tours, I don't care about. I've invited authors who haven't published a book for nine years because the themes that we wanted to speak about existed in their book from nine years ago. Who says because a book's nine years old, it shouldn't be bought anymore? You know, I'm all about, you know, the new trends, the hashtag, bring it back. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> the, the experience from my perspective, and I've had the full support of the Brighton team from day one, is to change the tenor of the conversation to make sure we've got more working class authors, more women writers, more writers of color, more black writers um, in the conversation. Because what tends to happen is also... Um, lots of the time you tend to get the same moderators. What I'm doing is I'm talking to young writers and I'm saying, are you comfortable moderating? So if you don't have a book yet, you, your book's not completed, you idolize this writer, do you want to moderate their session? Right? Um, when I asked, um, I mean, it didn't happen, of course, but when I asked Daniel Han, who's, who's watching this, so I'm name checking him because I know he's watching, um, <laughs> to, to, to moderate, the conversation with Ali Smith, which would have happened in May, I knew he was a big fan of her work, right? So I, he moderates and I usually have him to do, with stuff to do with translation because he's one of the most amazing translators in the world. And um, I'm a big fan of Agualusa, who he translates. Um, but it was like, yeah, have that conversation because I know you're a fan. And that is great for the author as well, right? to have somebody who's in conversation with them who actually really knows their work, not a moderator who's a named moderator, who's done the blurb and a couple of chapters and is just kind of finessing it. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but I've seen it. <laughs> and it, it's uncomfortable for the producer standing on the side, um, very uncomfortable. So yeah, um, I think the experience is very much, you know, it's, it's, it's an experience of ideas. Mm -hmm. It's very much an experience of ideas. Yeah, I think it's so interesting to see how slightly different they all are and how we're getting a kind of different experience out of all of them. And in that vein, I think it might be interesting to find out how you guys got into um, your roles as well. So your kind of career journey and maybe giving your tips along the way to the people watching and maybe interested in getting into it too. Who wants to start? Maybe Harriet? Um, I definitely fell into it. So I was a um, European events manager of Human Rights Watch where I met Daniel Hahn and managed to persuade him to help me with Henley. So he's now just done his hundredth, uh, he did his hundredth interview with us last year. So we're all 
big Daniel Hahn fans. Um, but he, um, I met him when I was at Human Rights Watch doing their events and I worked in kind of all events side of things. And then my mum decided after having left her job to start a festival because she thought it'd be fun. Um, we say that as a joke now because she always goes, I thought it would be fun. <laughs> Still not always fun. Um, and she kind of ran it. And at the beginning, they just kind of, got it was three days they didn't take anyone's contact details so in year two they had to start all over again but I kind of just helped with the logistics on the side as a volunteer and then it just sort of got bigger and bigger and I then have been in every single role here I mainly managed the sponsors for years and then I moved over to programming I did one year of programming and I went and had a baby and my brother stepped in and then he stood down so I have kind of fell upon this by accident um but my best kind of advice for career is I think is sort of uh in, in volunteering like being known going for coffee with people ask people for coffees I'm always going for coffees with people who want to talk about getting into this sort of thing you know just I don't know I think always being available and trying to talk to people um would be you know, my bit of advice on the career front. But yeah, mine was very accidental, but I do love my job and I don't ever have that Sunday feeling that I used to have in my old job. Yeah, great. How about you, Lindsay? Uh, so the, the short answer is I got a paid internship with the festival, which was three months. And it's the first time I sort of realised you could put events and books together in a job. And I was like, that feels like a really good uh, fit. Yeah, I love the blend of creativity and the academic side, but also kind of quite practical stuff and making it happen and the kind of energy there. Um, so I did the internship and then I got very well with the team and they made a programming assistant role, which um, I, I, I got and then basically worked my way up through from there. Um, but I mean, the long answer is I had a lot of jobs first. You know, I was in my mid-20s before I interned. Um, I worked in a box office. I did arts journalism. I did arts marketing. I worked in a heap of bars and restaurants and stack shelves and Tesco's and all sorts. And I don't regret any of that because I think when you work in events, you need people who, yes, know arts, know books and are big kind of creatives. But you need people who have those like practical skills as well and can keep a calm head and can relate to a huge range of people um so you know when I'm on site and things are going wrong and you have to keep calm head and solve things and placate people and juggle things I'm drawing on a busy restaurant shift to do that you know um or in an average hour at the festival you might kind of meet and greet Ian McEwen and his editor and have to sort of sound smart and, and welcome him but then you're crossing the festival site and you're dealing with a member of the public who's lost their kid and you have to deal with that and then you have to go in solve a grumpy sound technician's issue and get them to do what you need them to do. So you need to be able to talk to a huge range of people as well. So I think don't, the arts are hard to get into and they're not very well paid, particularly in the early stages. So if you're doing other jobs first, A, you're going to pick up amazing skills that you can draw upon and B, there's absolutely no shame in those jobs because I think they make you a stronger person when you're in those roles. And I would always pick someone who's had a more diverse kind of portfolio, whatever that is. Um, to someone who's just come out of Oxford, you know, with a double starred first in literature, because I want that life experience and I want that diversity of thought as well. That that's so crucial for programming. What was the question? How did I get into it? Yes, that, that's the question. So that's how I <laughs> that's how I got into it. But yeah, it was, it was a bit of an accident and and you know, do as much as you can. If you're at university, get involved in loads of societies, pick up those opportunities where you can. Um, talk to people, you know, try and be confident and bold. But that is the thing, I think, and, and I think confidence, what I'm trying to say here, I think the arts are quite wibbly to get into. There's no straight career path. There's no one sort of saying, right, you do this for this year, and then in year two you do this, and then in year three you earn this, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite hard to find your foothold and to find your foothold without any contacts, without much, you know, you need money to kind of survive and, and, and you need hopefully some good mentors and some people who believe in you uh, to get there. But you also just need to hold your nerve. And I think if you're from a background that isn't a traditional arts background and you don't think it's for you, chances are you're the person that that industry needs the most. Um, so it is about kind of holding your nerve and, and feeling like you belong in those spaces. And it's up to people like, you know, myself and me and Harriet who are in those roles to send the ladder back down and be supportive. And I think as Harriet was saying, she's always going for coffee and whenever anyone emails me or wants to chat, I always try and give them my time because you have a responsibility to, to do that. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And in that vein, we've had a couple of questions about volunteering opportunities with the festivals and whether that's kind of still going along with virtual festivals as well. I mean, I can talk on our behalf, you know, our work for, we've just, our team has been a bit affected um, with redundancies and things. So actually we got an email today from somebody saying they really want to get into it and could they come and volunteer for, you know, a couple of hours here and there. Abs I mean, absolutely. Because, and hopefully when on our way back out of this, if there is a way back out, then, you know, we're, we're going to need to build a team again because my brilliant team have all managed to get jobs, which is amazing, um, which I'm delighted for. But actually, it does mean that when we do get out of this, I, I'm very much on an island at the moment. On my own. So, you know, if I get to meet people now, if it, you know, if we do sort this and survive, then we're going to need people. So it's such a, I think in some respects, it's a brilliant time. But to volunteer, obviously, like I, we've always paid interns, we've always paid, I feel very strongly about it. Um, at the moment I would just ask a couple of hours of people rather you know go back to like the volunteering we have during the festival where people just come for a few hours and we kind of give them a job um, of taking tickets or whatever it would just be slightly different than it might be printing labels for the books and ticket but you know what I mean? but I do think that volunteering thing um, and just yeah I definitely would contact I think you'd be more in need now in my opinion and in our look than you we probably previously did need mm -hmm. yeah um, Ni, nee, also, how did you get into to events and what's your kind of biggest, best bit of advice? Um, well, I mean, I, I got into it because I, I love conversations. And, you know, I, so I said I started when I was in uni. I was studying food technology and I joined a writing group that met on Wednesday evenings at Common Word and they used to organize a slam. And so I got involved with that. There was a guy called Peter Kalu. Um, up in Manchester, and he was a huge mentor. That organization was actually started by Lem Sisse when he was like 19 or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I started organizing slams on the side. And when I left university, I went to work in the corporate world. When I came back into the arts world, I came as an editor. I was running Flip Type Publishing. And since we didn't have distribution, one of the things I did was organize events for my authors. We sold most of our books at events that I organized for our authors. Um, but I also think it's important for people to understand you can create your own space. And that's the most important bit of advice I'll give you because I've been a freelance programmer pretty much since that time in 1997 when I was a student. Um, I ran the African Writers Evening um, for a decade. I started at the Poetry Cafe and we were kind of headhunted by the um, South Bank Center. I ran it there for another few years and I was literally um, getting funding from the Arts Council and, and getting paid by the South Bank, booking tickets, doing visas, doing that. It was so much work, which is why I, I, you know, I, I put it on hiatus. I say it's on hiatus at the moment. Um, um, and I, I ran the African Book Festival, which I did at the Free Word Center when it was open. Um, I ran Caribbean Literary Salon. Um, I ran an event called Outdooring, where people would read from their um, books before they were published. Hisham Batao re read there, um, Chris Cleave before his first book, you know, because I was, I was saying that there have to be new ways of people experiencing literature. They have to understand the process. And so when Chris Cleave came, his book wasn't published. So it's like people were having conversations where he could actually say, you know what, maybe something might change in the final manuscript. It was the same with Hisham Mata. Um, so I did all sorts of events. I did Spoken Soul. I did um, Aroma Poetry. So people like Inua Elums did their first readings at poetry, you know, e events that I ran. Um, I ended up publishing a lot of these people. Um, so yeah, I think you can always create your own space. The number of literary events alone that I started that have been copied, that have been used in other ways, you know, it, for me, it's great because it means the conversations con continue. It also shows people that there are audiences for things, right? I, I remember when we were putting on a Somali literature evening at the South Bank and they were asking me if we would sell tickets. And I said to them, you have to understand that the Somalis have a literary tradition that goes back centuries. So just put the tickets on sale and wait. And what kept happening is they kept moving to a bigger room and a bigger room and a bigger room. And when the night happened, um, you know, it was loud and crazy in there, just beautiful to see. So sometimes creating your own space also shows the industry what the possibilities are. Um, and that's really important. And these days it's easier than ever. You know, when I started, I had to buy one of those box um, speaker things 
and a, and a stand, you know, and I would just go into cafes and, and, and kind of ask for space and stuff. But now you can even start a literary event online. You can, you can have an Instagram series. That's a literary event. Um, and eventually, you know, the industry sometimes comes to you. I mean, I, I started Brighton um, on the recommendation of a few people because Brighton was looking to fill the role very quickly. So I was one of the people recommended and then I went in for an interview, et cetera. And, you know, because of the range of my experience and as Lindsay says, you know, confidence is important. You know, I, I don't believe that um, if you put on the right kinds of conversations, people won't come. <laughs> so I, I can be very forceful about, yeah, of course I'll do it. It's not a problem. Um, and that's how, you know, I got into it. But because I didn't go through the traditional channels of internship, et cetera, et cetera, I did walk into a very big publisher's um, team at some point and they just said to me, who are you? Like they literally, it was like, who is this person who's now producing the Shrine Talks at Bright Festival? We've never seen him before because the periphery is a huge audience too, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So you can do a lot of stuff where the mainstream hasn't seen you. It doesn't mean you haven't got the experience. Um, and, and, you know, and that's the reality. And, so yeah, just understand that you can start in your own spaces, but you will get the internship experience because a lot of these events, when you're doing, they're not going to make you money. They're not going to make you a lot of money. You, you might make 10 pounds here and there, which is pretty much what a lot of interns get. They get some expenses and, you know, in my own work, as with Harriet, I try to pay interns as much. I mean, Brighton is a completely different thing because it's got an administrative structure. So I just, I just produce literary events. I don't get involved. When I want an intern, I say to my colleague, Catherine, I'm like, hey, you know, hey, it might be good to have some interns. And she sorts that out, which is a huge difference from when I was doing people's visas and making phone calls and saying, I've already bought the ticket. You've got to fix this. I don't have to deal with that anymore. So for me, this is actually very relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a big world out there. Yeah. So it's about conversations. If you have ideas push them through or talk to somebody who's a producer because actually a festival might say, you know what, that's a really interesting idea. We can have it as a strand in our festival. You don't work for us, but we'll do this. Yeah. I think it's really, yeah. I think it's really great to see how people have come in from different angles um, and, uh, and uh, in the same world and starting these conversations. Picking up on something you said as well, Ni, in terms of it won't be making you very much when you're kind of starting it yourself. Um, we have a question that's come in about the kind of digital experience and how people are perhaps less willing to pay for these digital experiences. Um, and are the festivals still making a profit or being run for other purposes, perhaps like providing a charitable service or even PR? Um, you know, as I said earlier on, this is one of the conundrums we have to figure out. And there are many ways in which these things happen. You know, there, there are organizations saying a suggested, a suggested donation or, you know, um, we'll send you a souvenir or whatever it is. There's, there's loads of ways in which people are approaching this. Um, and I don't think it will be figured out just in this season because this season is a reaction season almost. So there is no big plan for how we make it work. We're figuring it out as we go along, as with most of life. So yes, money is coming in because there are people who will ask you straight up. Even if you say it's free, they'll say, can we support? And that's a great mm -hmm. thing about audiences. It's not just always from the producers or the festival saying, give us your money. Sometimes people are just saying, this is a great experience. Can I support you? And people will support to the best of their abilities. It's the same way that museums to, to some degree, you know, support themselves. They say, suggest a donation. They leave a thing over there and somebody pops in a thousand dollars. Somebody pops in three pounds. I mean, you know, it's not an, an exact science, but for me, um, ultimately it's about making sure that the writer is remunerated. That yeah. is the bottom line. I don't care how the money comes in. Of course, you know, we will try and figure out ways to make it make money but the focus is paying the writer. So if we can't pay the writers, then we won't do it. So then the audience will meet us halfway, right? <laughs> because if they want to see these things, then we'll figure something mm -hmm. out. I mean, that's the way I see it. I think, I think it's a collaborative thing. I don't know. Lindsay, what do you think? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Fliss. I'm taking over your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do I think? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've made it work this year through a combination of we did a crowdfunder, um, our patrons pitched in, and that was the kind of immediate survival thing. And we did get some Arts Council um, emergency funding as well. Um, the main, I guess, source of income for the festival itself has come through sponsorship. Um, we found that our sponsors who were already on board, like the Times and Sunday Times and Bailey Gifford, they didn't abandon us in this toughest year yet, which is great. And it has brought in some new partnerships. So partnerships that are very digital, like Audible, have come on board yet this year for the first time. So I think there's obviously sponsor, some sponsors seeing real potential in terms of reach, in terms of new audiences, which is exciting. But I think Nee's point about this year being a reaction year and then needing to find sustainable models going forward, that's going to take some time. Um, everything's kind of thrown up in the air everyone's kind of gathered their bits that they need to keep running for this year and then it'll be really interesting to see how it pans out and I think the point about paying authors we pay everybody in the festival but I think one thing that we do all need to look at as an industry as we all move more digital is book sales um, because I think what I've been hearing is some of these big events these big digital events with huge reach actually the translation to book sales isn't very big and it'd be great to hear from Harriet because they're doing of book and ticket models but I guess my concern with book and ticket is then do you slide back from that accessibility benefit of digital but I don't, I don't know I mean Harriet I don't know if you want to jump in here yeah we've done a mix I was going to say because you kind of touched on it with the sort of do people buy things to get souvenirs so we've done a mix of um, book and ticket uh, and then just five pound tickets so we are um, we are doing that now what's interesting is the two biggest sellers are five pound ticket events at the moment as it sits um, which are they going to buy? Maybe they've bought the book. My kind of rule was if the book's been out for a long time, then it's a five pound ticket. And if it's just out, then it's a, that was kind of our approach. Um, it's a book and ticket. Um, but see, some of the book sales are brilliant, more brilliant. Uh, we've beaten on some of them, the biggest book sales we've ever had, like in a venue already. Um, uh, mainly for big names but that's also because of the scenario we were in because we just had so little time it was reactive and I would like to more I hope our lot will come out and buy books I really hope they will um, it'll be really interesting to see there's a lot of traction on that a lot of people wanted a kind of book and ticket for everyone option so like the smaller ones and then could they have both options so I think might be where the future looks so you kind of get a reduced ticket price if you buy the book you know I know that there are lots of other people doing that so I wonder if that might be the long term um i was saying earlier that we've had some quite surprises there's some names that i thought would do absolutely brilliant and would fly that aren't doing quite as well and then there are names that i just kind of said oh well we'll take that because it's really like political and it's really you know it's going to be a really interesting conversation now and i want to have it and the only way of having it is because of the rule that i made that if your book comes out that day we do book and take it um and they've done really well so mm -hmm. it's it's hard to tell but yeah the book sales has always been a kind of bottom line for us we've always because it's, yes, we absolutely pay authors and we have paid authors. I think we were one of the first first all to pay authors, all authors and we always have done and we really strongly believe in it. Um, and we pay a flat, flat fee to everyone. Um, but, um, so everyone's sort of considered the same. Um, but I think the encouragement has got to be on book sales and I think it's a really good point. And I think we'll see if it works. And actually the numbers where the numbers are probably nowhere near the numbers we'd get in an audience. If you translate that into book sales, they're getting way more book sales than they previously would. And actually it's an hour for us, it's from home. They don't have to go anywhere. So it's an hour with good Wi-Fi. I have a lot of conversations about people's internet speed now that I never thought I'd have. <laughs> Is it five megabytes or more? I kind of find myself asking everyone. Yeah, well, the message is, I suppose, that we need to go out there and, and go and listen and go to these events and buy some books. Um, yeah, so that's all we've got time for, sadly. I'd love to carry on talking to you all. It's been so interesting. And thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and joined in with us today. And thank you so much to our lovely panellists for taking the time to speak to us as well. So the recording of this will be available in a few days time. So it'll be sent to you by email if you'd like to watch back. And before you go, I just want to let you know about a few SYP events coming up. So as I said earlier, our mentorship scheme started today, launched today, and applications will be open on the 28th. There'll also be a chairs Q&A happening on the 9th of September to answer any questions about the scheme or the SYP in general. And on the 15th of October, we have an interview masterclass if you want to brush up on your interview skills. 
And of course, we have the amazing literary festivals that we've been hearing about this evening. So Cheltenham Literature Fest is the 2nd to the 11th of October and Henley is the 26th of September to the 4th of October and Brighton next year in May 2021, of course, as well. So thank you so much to everyone for coming. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Nice to see you all.